Robert H. Jackson, the 82nd Justice of the United States Supreme Court, returned home for the final time on October 13, 1954, with a funeral service held at the St. Luke's Episcopal Church and internment at the Maple Grove Cemetery, Frewsburg, New York. On October 10th, the residents of Chautauqua and Warren County woke up to the news of the passage of their most preeminent citizen, Robert H. Jackson, on October 9th, 1954, in Washington, D.C., of an apparent heart attack. The New York Times lead article detailed his extensive private and public career and noting his many and varied accomplishments. The New York Times article talked about the fact that Robert Jackson was born on February 13, 1892 in Spring Creek, Warren County, Pennsylvania. His father was William Eldred Jackson, a farmer, lumberman, and stock breeder. His mother was Angelina Howitt Jackson, and Jackson was of Scotch and Dutch ancestry. The Jacksons lived in a farmhouse about a mile east of Spring Creek on a hillside beside Broken Straw Creek. When Robert was five, the Jacksons moved to Frewsburg. There, his father and mother ran a hotel and an adjoining livery stable. It was in Frewsburg where Jackson gained his initial education. He was a 1909 graduate of Frewsburg High School, and he completed one year of postgraduate studies at the Jamestown High School in 1910. While attending Jamestown, he was on the debate team, and the quotation that appeared under this team picture was Robert Jackson, mark you, this promising young orator from Frewsburg. This certainly was an understatement. During this time period, Jackson was found clerking for his mother's cousin, Frank H. Mott, a prominent lawyer and active Democrat in Jamestown. In September 1911, Jackson began study at Albany Law School. After completing two years' work in one year, he returned to continue his clerkship at Mott's law office. In 1912, when this letter was written, he was not yet 21 years old, so he did not receive a degree from Albany Law School, nor could he be admitted to the bar. But even prior to his admission to the bar, he was very active in democratic politics, encouraging endorsements, and working on the Democratic Committee. After passing the New York bar exams in October 1913, he was admitted to the bar of New York State in November of that year but he had already tried his first case and won it. The case defended the striking transit workers in the summer of 1913. The first case went to the jury, which refused to convict the defendant, and the rest of the cases were dismissed. This gave the young lawyer-to-be a taste of advocacy, which continued throughout his career. He said later in his career, I was never a crusader, I just liked a good fight. The 1950 city directory finds Robert H. Jackson in practice with Frank Mott. During his years in Albany, Robert Jackson met and subsequently married in 1916 Irene Alice Gerhardt, daughter of a builder in nearby Kingston, New York. The Jacksons had two children, a son, William Eldred Jackson, who would later become a lawyer and serve as his father's personal aide at the Nuremberg Trials, 
and Mary Margaret Jackson. In 1980, in 1918, Jackson became Corporation Counsel for the City of Jamestown and at the time was also Vice President and General Counsel of the Jamestown Street Railway Company, the Jamestown Westfield and Northwestern Railroad, and the Jamestown Telephone Company. Also, Governor Franklin Roosevelt was casting his eye on young Jackson. Governor Roosevelt is seen here with Jackson on the right and in the center Frank Mott, Jackson's uncle and mentor. One of Jackson's first administrative appointments was as a member of the New York State Commission to investigate the administration of the New York justice system. The 1920 city directory finds the law firm of Dean Edson and Jackson consisting of B.S. Dean, Walter Edson, Robert Jackson, and Henry Manley. The family was living on 16 Spruce. In 1922 they moved to their home in Lakeview Avenue and the corner. 1924 saw the creation of the law firm of Jackson, Manley, and Herrick with Robert Jackson joining Henry Manley and Gerald Herrick at 600 Fenton Building. Here is an opinion letter to the village of Faulkner by Robert Jackson. In 1926, they moved their offices to the Hotel Jamestown Building. In 1928, a law firm was created of Jackson, Herrick, Durkin, and Leet, including Gerald Herrick, John Durkin, and Ernie Leet, which would last until December 31st, 1932. The balance of his private practice was in partnership with John Durkin. In 1934, now President Franklin D. Roosevelt appointed Robert Jackson to his first post in Washington in the Bureau of Internal Revenue as its general counsel. Even while in Washington, Robert Jackson maintained an office at the 2425 Bank of Jamestown building. While serving in that capacity, Jackson delved into the Andrew Mellon Empire and brought a $3 million tax claim against the former Secretary of the Treasury. The claim was ultimately settled for $750,000 but Jackson's reputation was exceedingly enhanced. In March of 1938, Jackson was appointed Solicitor General. In that advocate's position, which he loved, Jackson argued and won many cases for the government before the Supreme Court. In fact, Justice Louis Brandeis said Jackson should be Solicitor General for life. In 1940, President Roosevelt appointed Jackson U.S. Attorney General. One of his assignments was to advise the President whether he had the authority, without seeking the approval of Congress, to conclude an executive agreement with Great Britain. The United States proposed transferring to the British 50 overage destroyers, which England desperately needed to combat the Germans, in exchange for naval and air bases on the British possessions in the Western Hemisphere. Jackson's favorable opinion provided a strong underpinning for that vital transaction. Frequently during this time period, Jackson would come home to the Jamestown area and enjoy family and friends. President Roosevelt had informed Jackson of his plan to appoint him Chief Justice when Charles Evans Hughes retired. However, when that event occurred, the three of them agreed that it would be best for the court and for Jackson if he were to first serve first as an Associate Justice under Harlan Fisk Stone, 
who was then elevated to Chief Justice. Jackson was appointed June 12, 1941 and was confirmed by the Senate July 7th. During Jackson's 13 year of service on the high bench, he delivered 148 opinions for the court, 46 concurrences and 115 dissents. As the Supreme Court biographical booklet states, his style was clear, direct, and persuasive so that his opinions were easily understood. And occasionally they would be punctuated by sarcasm or cynicism and sometimes spiced with humor. Quote, we are not final because we are infallible, but we are infallible because we are final, he once said about the court. As a sidelight, when Justice Jackson took up offices in the Supreme Court building in Washington, there was an element of home to greet him. Much of the furniture in the Supreme Court building was manufactured by Jamestown Royal Upholstery Company of Jamestown, New York. In April 1945, Justice Jackson acceded to President Truman's request that he become chief U.S. prosecutor against the leaders of Nazi Germany for their wars of aggression and war crimes and the atrocities they ordered or permitted. During his leave of absence from the Supreme Court, Jackson set up an office in Paris, assembled a staff, and prepared, in cooperation with the Allies, the prosecution of 20 Nazi war criminals. Jackson gave the opening statement for the prosecution on November 21, 1945, at Nuremberg, Germany. On October 1, 1946, the International Military Tribunal met for the last time to sentence the guilty defendants. Jackson believed that the long months at Nuremberg were well spent in the most important, enduring, and constructive work of my life. After the trial, President Truman awarded Justice Jackson the Medal of Merit because of extraordinary fidelity and exceptionally meritorious conduct as prosecutor. Jackson explained the new theory of international law as follows. No longer may the head of a state consider himself outside the law and impose inhuman acts on the peoples of the world. Jackson returned to the court in 1946 and participated until his death in 1954. One of the most meaningful cases was the Youngstown Sheet and Tube Company versus Sawyer case, also known as the Steel seizure case, which invalidated President Truman's attempted seizure of private steel mills during the Korean War to prevent a strike. Again, the Supreme Court booklet cited Jackson produced a thoughtful explanation of the basic constitutional doctrine of separation of powers that the court found helpful in the Watergate cases many years later. Justice Jackson suffered a heart attack on March 30, 1954, and was advised that he could look forward to a relatively long life if he curtailed his activities, but that a continuation would represent a risk of death at almost any time. He characteristically chose the latter course and left the hospital on May 17 to be on the bench when the court's unanimous anti-segregation decision in Brown v. Board of Education was announced. The Monday edition of the Post Journal announced the death of Robert Jackson and further announced the plans concerning the returning home of Robert Jackson to his native Jamestown and Frewsburg. H. Jackson died October 9, 1954 of a heart attack. A funeral was held in Washington, D.C., and on Wednesday, October 13, 1954, his remains were brought to Jamestown and lay in state at St. Luke's Church, where the funeral was held that afternoon with burial in the Maple Grove Cemetery, Frewsburg, New York. 
There were many editorials. The Jamestown Post Journal of October 11, 1954 stated, The nation mourns a great statesman and jurist in the death on Saturday of Justice Robert H. Jackson of the United States Supreme Court. But we in Jamestown, who have had the privilege to call him friend and neighbor, feel an even deeper grief and loss in the death of Bob Jackson. He was no less the great statesman and jurist to us, but even more, he was a man of homely character, true sincerity, wonderful friendliness, and honest humility. On that same day in Washington, Chief Justice Earl Warren made these remarks at the opening of the session of court. After doing so, in respect to his memory, the court adjourned until Thursday, October 14th, 1954.